On the first Sunday of every month, the Friends of Waikumiti Cemetery conduct a guided tour of some of the more notable residents in this old graveyard. And one of the stops is this overgrown grave here. In loving memory, our beloved daughter and sister, Thelma Claris Trott, died 15th of April 1935, aged 29 years. And at the bottom of the plaque is this added inscription, waiting till we meet again, Frida. It all seems very unassuming, but in fact, Thelma Trott's death was to play center stage to one of the most scandalous murder trials this century. It was the scandal of the 1930s, murder, sex, and show business. The beautiful Thelma Trott, apparently murdered by her husband, the well-known musician Eric Mario. Cause of death, barbiturate poisoning. And the Frida who left the message on the headstone was Miss Frida Stark, Thelma's closest friend. The same Frida Stark who was later to become famous for her risque dancing. Clothed in nothing but gold paint, she entertained the US troops here in New Zealand during the war years. I found Frida in a rest home in Hearn Bay, now in her 80s and a little more camera shy than she used to be. The incident is now a distant memory, but Frida has never forgotten Thelma. She was, what will I say, the most wonderful thing in my life. I asked Frida about the message she left, waiting till we meet again. That yes. was important to me. It's still in my memory. I've always just thought, well, we, we'll meet again. She was just very beautiful and she seemed to be loaded with talent. I absolutely doted on her. So you were lovers, basically? Yes. We were show business people and we just did what we liked. It was our life. The Civic Theatre, home to the Winter Garden Cabaret. Regular stomping ground for our showbiz threesome. It was the glamour life, parties, performances, and after hours decadence. And the players in tonight's drama, Eric Mario, 45, charming with an artistic temperament, a talented musician and composer, a ladies' man with a habit of two-timing, and an entrepreneur with a fondness for branding. And our leading lady, 29-year-old actress Thelma Trott, incredibly glamorous, an accomplished linguist and singer, but emotionally fragile with a tendency to be a drama queen. She also had a preference for what they described in the 30s as the other kind of woman. Finally, Frida Stark, early 20s, a petite four foot 10, extrovert and vivacious, Secretary by day, a dancer by night, she was lured and dazzled by the bright lights of showbiz. The musician, the actress, and the dancer, all three would become entangled in a tragic plot that would far outshine any they had performed on stage. Thelma met Mario when they worked together on a touring theatrical show in Australia. When the production came to New Zealand, Frida Stark joined their ranks as a dancer. Thelma was the leading lady, the star, but hard times hit the show. The tour collapsed and they were out of a job. Mario and Thelma decided to marry. It seemed like a marriage made in heaven, the beautiful star and the charismatic musical director. But a closer look reveals a marriage of dependence and convenience. Thelma had 500 pounds. Mario was broke. But soon, Thelma was spending more and more time with Frida. They became close friends. When Mario produced the comic opera Duchess of Danzig, Thelma was once again the star playing the lead role of the Duchess and featuring in the ballet chorus her friend Frida. Behind the veneer of glamour, tension rippled. Frida and Thelma's developing intimacy included frequent weekend visits where Frida slept over in Thelma's bed. At the same time, Thelma's husband, Mario, had developed a close liaison with Miss Eleanor Brownlee, who'd come to him for piano lessons. She became his secretary for 10 shillings a week. 
Mario would later declare that he and Thelma had a non-intercourse agreement and told police, my wife was fonder of women than men, if you know what I mean. These were, of course, the depression years and the entertainment industry had hit hard times. Mario's finances were at an all-time low, having now spent all of Thelma's money. Thelma had become nervous and difficult, out of work and drinking heavily, on top of which he developed a fear of pregnancy, threatening suicide if it should occur. With such fragile temperaments, arguments erupted with accusations of infidelity and lesbianism. Mario accused Thelma of being a woman of ill repute and to get out on the streets where she belonged. Thelma answered she would if he gave her back her 500 pounds. I asked Frida why things fell apart so badly. She was trapped. She knew that she wouldn't get a show business job. She let herself go. She had no personality, no drive anymore. Frida blames Mario. He was the pressure. He cracked the whip and had us all jumping to his tune. She was insecure. It was here, in this Mount Eden house, that the story took its tragic turn. The date, Friday the 12th of April, 1935. Thelma had started to feel unwell that day, so she spent the day in bed. By Saturday morning, Thelma was unsteady on her feet and delirious. It would appear that Thelma was already under the influence of Veronal, a barbiturate, a popular sedative of the time. It would have come in the form of pills like these, and an overdose could kill. Frida Stark came to visit about four o'clock that afternoon. Thelma's condition seemed to be worsening, and Frida suggested to Mario that he call a doctor. Mario said he'd get a doctor later. Meanwhile, he slipped out for a brief appointment with Eleanor Brownlee. An hour later, Mario returned to find Thelma awake and groggy. Frida suggested they try smelling salts to improve Thelma's condition. Frida chatted with Thelma to keep her awake. At this point, Mario decided to make hot milk for everyone. He made three cups of hot milk and gave the first two to his son, Graham. Graham took the first two cups of hot milk through to the bedroom, one for himself and one for Frida. Alone in the kitchen, Mario poured a third cup of hot milk the prosecution would allege that Mario dissolved more than a hundred grains of Veronal into the milk before taking it to his ailing wife. The critical question of the trial was, did Mario deliberately lace the milk with a fatal dose of Veronal? All three of them tried to make Thelma drink the milk. After half a cup, she refused to drink any more. Shortly after, she became sleepy again. Frida again asked Mario to get a doctor, but Mario said it wouldn't hurt for her to sleep through the night. He later justified this by saying that Thelma was often drunk and slept heavily. On Sunday morning, Thelma did not wake up. Mario ignored her condition and Frida's request for a doctor. He was busy elsewhere. Thelma did not wake up at all that day, and by Sunday evening, Frida had to go home. By Monday morning, Thelma's condition was even worse. Early that afternoon, Frida returned and found Thelma in a terrible state, so she called a doctor herself. He arrived and immediately declared a case of veronal poisoning. Thelma was taken to hospital, where she died a few hours later. The tragedy had reached its climax. The beautiful Thelma was now dead, Frida was grief-stricken, and within months, Mario would be arrested for the murder of his wife. The trial was a national talking point. People queued for ringside seats to hear the intimate details. 
Frida Stark was a star witness for the prosecution, in the witness box a whole day giving evidence. Mario was to have two trials. A verdict of guilty was returned by both juries, even though the evidence was entirely circumstantial. Mario spent the next 12 years in jail as a model prisoner, while friends and supporters continued to believe in his innocence. Mario made the most of his circumstances. His cell was elegantly furnished and his privileges included playing the piano and composing. His ability to charm the ladies had not diminished either. A hospital physiotherapist providing treatment to Mario fell in love with him. They married when Mario was released from prison in 1948. Mario was 57 years old. He continued to write music and died in 1960. And Frida? Well, she survived the grueling ordeal of the trial to become famous all over again, when a couple of years later she began dancing with the ponies at the Civic Winter Garden. Frida didn't dwell on the past. She told me she got over Thelma's death and got on with living. She became a celebrity in her own right, dancing under the stage name La Toile, meaning the star. After the war, she retired from dancing and went abroad to England, where she met dancer Harold Robinson. They married, traveled, and although now divorced, they remain the best of friends. But throughout it all, Frida never forgot Thelma. This painting of Thelma remains one of her most treasured possessions. I still dream that perhaps we might meet again one day, but uh, that's something that we all say, but I don't believe. I think when we die, we die, we've gone. Despite Frida's doubts about life after death, there's no doubt about where Frida's final resting place will be. When Thelma was buried, Frida bought this plot right next door. So, one way or another, they'll always be side by side. And they'll continue to share the limelight. Every time another tour party comes by, the drama of Thelma, Frida and Mario is briefly enacted again. In Wellington's Bolton Street Cemetery lies the grave of Thomas Hawkins, victim of a savage murder in 1889. Murdered. It's a pretty blunt epitaph. Murdered. By whom and why? This case has always attracted a lot of attention, spawning at least two books that suggest the police got the wrong man. The victim, Thomas Hawkins, was English and farmed 500 acres here in Kaiforofora with his wife Mary and their nine children. He was coming home from Wellington with dress material for his wife and a birthday present for a daughter. Hawkins was in the habit of walking his horse and cart up from the hut road, because the track was so steep. Not far from home, he was ambushed. The post-mortem revealed Hawkins had been shot twice, the second time with a shotgun. Not only that, he was stabbed 21 times. Significantly, the stab wounds appeared to have been caused by a double-edged blade. Suspicion immediately fell on Louis Chemis, an Italian neighbor who rented his property from Hawkins. Hawkins' property was known as Homebush Farm. A couple of days before the murder, Hawkins' wife Mary had overheard her husband and Louis Chemis arguing about a land lease. She later told the police that she'd heard Louis Chemis threaten her husband with the words, I'll have you yet. Louis Chemis is married to Annie. They have five children. He farms their property besides working as a laborer for the Hutt County. Three days after Hawkins is killed, Chemis is arrested, pleading his innocence. More than a century later, Peter Chemis, his great-grandson and a Wellington lawyer, is convinced of Louis's innocence. He studied the evidence in detail. He says it doesn't stack up, even though it might have seemed compelling at the time. They'd argued over property, and Louis had the type of weapons that fitted the murder. 
We know that the knife wounds in Hawking's body were the result of a double-edged blade, and Louis Chemist possessed such a blade, a stiletto. The gunshot wounds in Hawking's body were the result of a double barrel shotgun, which Louis Chemist also possessed. And some of those gunshot wounds may have been caused by a revolver, which Louis also possessed. But most damning of all is the fact that paper found in Hawking's wounds exactly matched newspaper found in Louis's house. Now, given all of that evidence, how can you possibly believe that there's no doubt as to his innocence? Paul, I say there was no doubt because entirely the evidence was circumstantial. Uh, the police relied heavily on two pieces of evidence. First, the stiletto. Uh, they say that the wounds in Mr Hawkins were caused by a double-edged knife. And because they had found a stiletto at Louis's house, then it must have been Louis. The stiletto was very old, it had rust all over it. There was no suggestion it had been used in, in any crime or used at all. Now, the other piece of evidence which was crucial was the newspaper. A uh, doctor found a small piece of newspaper in the wound. Paper used as wadding in the shotgun cartridge fired at Hawkins. Four policemen had picked up newspaper. Uh, they'd wrapped some of the evidence in a newspaper. Some of it was in the pocket of policemen. In today's world, if that evidence went uh, uh, before a court, the judge would probably say it was very unsafe or not to be relied upon. Questionable evidence, but that wasn't the only problem Louis Camus would have to contend with. His lawyer, Charles Bunny, is ill. He has strong witnesses ready to appear, but doesn't call them. He doesn't even appear for the judge's summing up and isn't there for sentencing. Two days later, he died. He just wasn't up to it. In today's world, the case wouldn't have gone on because the lawyer was sick. The third thing I think is perhaps the most important is that Louis was Italian. The prosecutor, in his summing up, said that the wounds were of a nature which meant it was unlikely that an Englishman committed the crime. In the judge's summing up, he said the murder weapon was in common use amongst the nation from which the prisoner came, and therefore you could link the prisoner to the crime. Now I say that was, it was simply racism. Racism or not, Louis Chemis is found guilty and sentenced to death. Louis Chemis is transferred to Auckland's Mount Eden Jail. A petition to spare his life is started, even some of the jury members who convicted him sign it. His loyal wife, Annie, employs one of the country's top lawyers, Edwin Jellico, to help save her husband's life. And they succeed. They manage to get the death sentence commuted to life imprisonment. But despite growing public support, they fail to win a retrial. Annie is made of stern stuff. She continues the fight, struggling to keep her family alive by taking cleaning jobs. Despite the setbacks, she never gives up. Fate came to their rescue. 1897 is Queen Victoria's 60th Jubilee, and to celebrate, an amnesty gives freedom to 18 prisoners in New Zealand. The authorities can at last release chemists without losing face. It seems like the nightmare is over. But things are never quite the same. After eight years in prison, his family are almost strangers to him. His eldest child is now 16. Louis finds that he can't get work. The prejudice against him is now double-edged like his stiletto. He's Italian and he's a convicted murderer. He manages to find some work, but mostly he's unemployed. Louis sinks into a depression. Again, it's Annie who supports the family. Unable to bear the shame of seeing his wife get up at 3 a.m. every morning to go off to work whilst he stays in bed, Louis Chemist decides to take drastic action. The recent suicide of MP James Larnock seemed to prey on his mind. He told Annie, if a man holding a high position would do such a thing, I wonder what a poor fellow who could not get any work would do. The answer was not long in coming. 
His headless body is discovered the next day. Distraught but undeterred, Annie doesn't give up in her bid to find out what happened that fateful night at Kaiforafora. She brings to light new evidence that the real killer may have been a poacher. A dead hare and a rock covered with blood were found next to the body, but not reported by the police. Not only that, but a shotgun ammunition pouch and a butcher's knife were found in a creek on Hawking's property soon after the murder. Hawking's had been seen arguing with a poacher just days before the murder, and the poacher had threatened to kill him. But this evidence was never brought before the court. In another Wellington cemetery lies Louis Chemis. His grave bears a simple inscription, no hint of the tragic circumstances of his life and death. But Louis Chemis hasn't been forgotten by his family. Peter Chemis and his wife, Jane McDiarmid, have made sure Louis's name will live on through his great, great grandson. We like the name. It was a family name. Partly I see this as a, an opportunity to give another Louis Chemis uh, a much better life than the, the Louis Chemis in the 19th century had.